but uh, we'll talk, we're talking about Phoenix 1.3 today. Uh, show of hands, who has Phoenix in production here? Curious? Wow. Awesome. So uh, nothing's going to break. So for those of you in production, um, but today we're talking about some of the kind of design decisions uh, behind the new generators and some little bit of a course correction. And uh, if you saw the Orlando talk, uh, the first few slides would be review, but the rest of the talk is really going to be um, all about the thinking behind that and how to think about structuring applications and why we're making these changes. So I work at Dockyard. If you haven't heard, uh, we do Elixir and Phoenix. So if your company needs help building out a product, uh, we'd be happy to help you. So check us out. And uh, I, a little personal uh, level up in my own life, I've been memed. So, so thank you, Luke and Jason. Uh, this, this photo was taken yesterday, and I'm now, I've been memed. So it was my own kind of personal achievement for, for turning 30 this year. I became an internet meme. So pretty cool. Um, but on, a, on another note, so a couple things are going away with Phoenix 1.3. You may have seen this slide. Uh, we are losing the root level uh, web directory. And we are kind of killing the uh, term model anywhere in the code base. And we'll talk about why uh, this is happening. But I think we, this term has kind of just been more confusion, uh, more frustration than it's worth. Uh, but with Phoenix 1.2 or prior to 1.2, uh, we had a directory structure like this uh, that Jose and I thought was a great idea um, because we wanted to send the message that, OK, this is an Elixir application. right? You have a lib. And just when you run Mix Phoenix New, you get an Elixir app. You don't get a Phoenix app. And we would create this root level web folder to send this message that the web part of your application isn't the <laughs> domain of your application. right? So we, we chose this decision to send a good message. Um, but people saw this, and they were just like, you're a framework, and you're prescribing how I should run my application. You're generating something special. This isn't an Elixir app. Uh, so this ended up being like a backlash for people thinking we were trying to be extra special and taking over your application. Um, so what we're doing now is something um, really creative is, well, this is, this, we wanted to send this message, right? You have your app and you have a web interface, but people got mad. So we hit the drawing board, did some computer science research, and now we're going to take web and we're moving it inside lib. And now everyone's happy, right? Yeah, this was, this was, a, this was like the last six months of research. Um, yeah, so that's it. In, end of the talk. Um, so, so this it's funny because there's actually there are other reasons behind the Elixir compiler why we had a root level web directory, but it originally was to send this good message. Um, but there did need to be changes to the Elixir compiler to move web inside of lib because of code reloading. Uh, so those changes were made. So it was a little more complicated than that. Um, but we still want to send this message, and I think we can send the same message uh, by having web inside of lib, because lib is where you write your application code. And if the web is part of your application, then you write your web code in lib web, just like you would structure anything else. Uh, so we can still con continue to send this message and generate a normal Elixir application. And uh, the only special thing is we're going to give you a root level assets directory. Uh, so now we don't pollute your root level project with like a package JSON or a node modules folder. All of that, regardless of what you want to use, if you're using Brunch, if you're using Ember, um, Webpack, whatever you want to use, will just live inside assets and your um, 30 million node files and node modules will live inside assets. So as long as those, as long as your asset builder can build your assets from the assets directory into priv static, then it's fine. So this, I think, is a, is a big win. And we're also introducing a web namespace. So a little bit more typing, but again, we want to send this message of if you know you naturally namespace your modules based on your folder hierarchy anyway. Uh, but when you see this, this is kind of reinforcing like, okay, this module of my application is um, the web layer, right? This is the the web interface to my greater domain. So a little bit more typing, but um, with aliasing, this is pretty much a a, a non-issue. And kind of the bigger changes is around the code that we generate with uh, Mix Phoenix Gen. Uh, so we've always said generators are learning tools, and they're supposed to be like not the end point of your design, but the starting point to try to kind of give you, get your feet wet, get up and running quickly, and teach you best practices. But I think we haven't done enough teaching in the right direction. Uh, so let's walk through maybe why that is. Uh, so with Phoenix 1.2, we generated code like this with Ecto. So you could say repo all, give me all the comments. Like it's just two lines of code. It reads nicely. The database access 
Like, you know, I'm hitting re a repo, but that repo could be a gen server, right? That repo could be an ETS table, it could be Postgres database, it doesn't really matter. So there is some, some nicety here, but it gets worse when we kind of look at more complex code. So when we also generated a persistence uh, function in the controller, this is where uh, we would kind of be hand wavy. We would say, like, well, by default, we're just gonna say, you're gonna have a repo, you can insert uh, some changes into the database, and if you need like something more complex, we just kind of hand wave and say, well, you can then extract that code and put it in a module. Um, but the problem is um, what newcomers see is like, okay, I run this command and Phoenix put my code here. So this is where I write my code. Um, and so it's not their fault, it's our fault. because we're kind of sending that message. And then it gets worse when there's no clear, there's no clear point where you feel like, okay, should I extract this? Is this too much? Is this too complex? Uh, so we can do a better job. Because if we walk through, what would happen is people would say, okay, I wanna add this simple feature. I wanna be able to um, comment on, on posts. So they'd say, well, I only have to add two lines of code in this controller, so if I need to associate a post and a comment, I'll just add ecto put asoc, uh, fetch the post, and I'm good to go. Uh, but the problem is we're now sprinkling these details of like how do I associate these data structures, how are they persisted, how do I fetch posts, uh, all in the controller. So if I wanna reuse this, any Anywhere else in my application, I have to know that I need to extract it, but most likely people are just gonna duplicate this code. <coughs> so we can already see, like, as soon as people start trying to extend the code that we generate, we've sent the message, like, this is where you write it, so then they just add a couple lines. And this is like the, the ball of mud scenario, where you think, like, oh, I'm only adding two lines of code, it can't be bad. And then you do that for, for five years, and now your controller create is 100 lines of code. So we can do a better job here. So with Phoenix 1.3, we're gonna generate code like this, where you used to say mix Phoenix gen HTML or JSON comment, where you, we give a module, we're not gonna require you to give a, a namespace module, what we're calling a context. So you're gonna have to say mix Phoenix gen JSON blog comment. So you're gonna have to think a little bit ahead of your design, a little, so we're making you think, okay, like well, what is this comment system? Where does it live? What's the purpose of this? And then we'll generate code in the controller like this. that just says some generic blog list comments. Like I don't care how they're being listed or fetched. Maybe it's from Postgres, maybe it's from an Ecto repo, maybe it's directly out of an agent running some process. And then likewise with persistence, we're gonna generate some generic create comment function. And this way, we're gonna generate code by default that doesn't live in the controller. The controller literally is just an interface, web interface, into your greater uh, domain. And then likewise, when a, a user comes here for create, they have kind of a nice rubric that they're saying, okay, if I wanna add this feature, Phoenix has kind of pushed me into say, okay, I have this function already that can create a comment. Now if I wanna associate the post in a comment, there's a place in my application where that lives. So they can say, okay, I can fetch the post because I have a public function and interface to do that. And then I can just extend the code that Phoenix has generated for me. And you may notice here that I'm using the Lixer's with expression. So if you haven't used it much, um, it's amazing. But if you notice here, we're not matching on like what happens if a, a blog create comment has some other uh, return value than something that was okay. Like what if we get an error back with some invalid data? What if there's a you know, unique constraint violation? And uh, we don't have to handle that here. So one thing with, especially with JSON controllers, like a Docker, we build mostly uh, JSON uh, APIs. Uh, we had a lot of repetition in our code, where it's basically like, if you get an error back or error change set, like, okay, convert the change set errors to a JSON message, return the right HTTP response, and you're done. And then you do that in every controller and every other action over and over and over. Uh, so we're introducing this new feature called uh, Action Fallback. It's a macro on the controller that says, if your, so your, your controller is a plug, so if your controller action returns something other than a valid plug connection, we're gonna invoke this other plug whose job is to take the connection before the action and the value that was returned and then convert that into a valid response. Uh, so this gets rid of a ton of duplication and gives you some nice uh, features. So imagine here where I say, okay, create this comment. And then if it was successful, I can do the successful path. But if there was some invalidation, or any other error condition, I can define this fallback controller. That's just a plug, so I can just define some functions that pattern match on the data types of my domain. So if I can say, you know, in my domain, if I'm using Ecto, 
I'm gonna have a set of changes that could be returned. And if, it's, if I get error change set, I know that I'm gonna put the unprocessable entity uh, status and I'm gonna render the change set view. And I can just do this in one place and then I can continue and just define more clauses for other uh, data types in my domain. So if I wanna standardize, you know, if my API boundaries define like error not found as a return type, if I just wanna handle that in one place instead of 100 places in my controller, I can just use a with expression, use action fallback and say, okay, anytime I call into something in my domain that returns error not found, I know that that's gonna be a 404 render the correct view. It's in the right response. Uh, so for us, this is, especially at Dockyard, this definitely removed a ton of boilerplate. Um, for HTML uh, uh, controllers, it's not quite as useful. Uh, you may be able to use it in some cases, but there's often times where you have to put a flask message, render specific templates, uh, but if you're building JSON APIs, I think people will really like this feature. Um, so let's talk a little bit about why web models is going away other than this root level folder. Um, so I think part of the problem is uh, this the term model I think is, is wrong. So when we took this decision, it was like, okay, web models, we, we've used in other backgrounds. A lot of us come from Ruby. Um, but if, if we look here, I, I was client code was coming in where people would say, hey, we need this new feature, you need to help us out, or I would, I would be talking to other people in the community that had larger um, Phoenix projects. And as we were like pairing and going through their code, we'd open the web models directory and it would just be like 50 files. And the problem here is like you have no view in the application. Like if I look at this directory structure, it's just the dumping ground. Like do, I can't really tell what this application does, right? It's like I can say, okay, you have users, um, you have comments somewhere, like we don't know how these are associated, we don't know what depends on what, um, so we're not sending the right message here. Like I wanna be able to look at your app, just open the directory and see like, oh, I can kind of see what this application does and understand the feature set. So we wanted to get rid of this dumping around and also the word, well, the word model just doesn't make sense because the entire point of your application is to model your domain, right? There's no reason to call some individual file a model. It's like the entire point of the application is to model your domain and you do that with uh, Elixir files that have modules and functions, right? So the Phoenix generators are gonna generate code like this where we can say, when you say mix Phoenix gen HTML or JSON blog comment, blog post, we're gonna generate a blog EX file and then within that it's gonna have its own data structures, right? It's gonna say I'm gonna have this boundary here and I'm gonna manage my own data structures and you can only talk to me through this public boundary that I'm gonna define and we're calling that a context. So we ship with Ecto by default. So by default, within a blog directory, we're gonna generate a post and a comment schema, and these are just data structures that the, the blog system uses. But if I have some sales system, right, I can just look at this directory structure and say, okay, instead of web models, blog, sales, post, comment, payment, order, I can have a clear look just by seeing no code at all. I can say, okay, I know this app has a blog system. I know it can have posts and comments, and I can see, okay, there's a sales system with orders and payments. And I know just by looking at this that I can only talk from the sales and the blog system through their API boundaries. So the sales system can't just suddenly call into repo insert comment, right? These things are totally opaque to each other. So we're trying to send this message of isolation. And I'm going to get a little bit into design patterns here, but no one freak out about this. Um, but the word context might be a little unusual, but. Um, as Jose and I were thinking about, okay, it's like, you know, we, we clearly need to do better about teaching, um, but we have to, you know, there, there's no one size fits all. So when we generate code as a best, best practice, we can't, we don't know what you're trying to build. So the fact that you are passing blog comment, there's a ton of information there that like, you know, what do we name the function? So it's, it's, a, it's a balance of, we can't assume too much about your app, but we wanna teach you kind of the best practice to take that code and then grow it into a successful application. Uh, so we started looking around at you know, prior art and the bounded context pattern uh, for a Martin Fowler is I think kind of resonated because it's not some grand uh, pattern, right? It's pretty much just a set of ideas. Uh, so this is a little bit of opaque here, like you know, bounded context deals with domain driven design where different contexts are being explicit about their interrelationships. Um, but I like to say basically bounded contexts make the uh, boundaries of your APIs clear. And that's the goal. So it's not that we're adopting a design pattern from Fowler, so don't start tweeting that like, oh, Phoenix has now chosen a design pattern. It's just we took, this, um, we took this concept and we took inspiration from it 
and it fits well with functional programming because one of the things that happened when I really got into functional programming and Elixir was I started like looking, like Googling for like functional design pattern books. Like, you know, I, I needed to like, how do I write my code properly? How do I structure it? And I couldn't, like, I thought I was doing it wrong, but it turns out like, like spoiler alert, like the, the, what you do in functional programming is like you write modules and they have functions and they're well named. <laughs> And uh, that's it, no, seriously, that's it. So, so just this term bounded context isn't a design pattern, it's just you need to think a little bit about the boundaries of your modules and functions, and that's, that's the extent of the design that you need. If you think properly about that, I think you're gonna end up with a successful application. So we're taking this idea, and like I, I mentioned with like the sales and the, the blog system, there's another diagram from Fowler where he's just showing that like you have these different boundaries of your app. And the sales and support example here, like these things can only talk across well-defined APIs. So you're not gonna end up in this case of web models where you can just see, okay, it's like I have a post here and I have an order, so then I can just call repo insert and I can kind of cross this boundary. I end up with like all these interrelationships and there's no clear separation. And again, I wanna be able to look at a directory structure of anyone writing a, a, an Elixir or a Phoenix project and be able to see exactly what the app, that app's doing. And I can say like, okay, I can just, visually form a, a boundary here. And I know that if I wanna talk to these, these inner uh, modules, I need to do it through their public API. And then one thing I wanna push that the generators don't do, because I think it's, it's not a, a one size fits all, but I want people to start thinking about uh, data centric schemas if they're using Ecto, because Ecto is almost two libraries at this point. One is like a, a data casting and validation library and one's a persistence library. Um, so one thing I do in my applications is I model my, uh, like I think for, for most people, you wanna keep your view layer concerns out of your core data structures. Um, so especially for me, like coming from Rails where I'd open up a, a user a model and then I would just have like 30 fields related to like whether the user checked remember me, all these like anytime you needed a new feature on some form somewhere, it would become a new field. It's like that, these are core data structures of your application, uh, let's keep them um, core to what they're designed for. So if I want a registration form, in Ecto I can use the embedded schema feature to say, okay, I can model this, this form as a data structure, pure data structure, with a name, email, password, and a remember me field. And then I can have some registration module that had some well-defined function, like register user. So instead of like repo insert user, right, it's going to be, you know, it's like we have a, a boundary here that says I have a registration that handles user registration, and it's going to register a user, right? There's like intent in that naming. And it takes in some, uh, a raw map of data, it casts it as an embedded schema, which just returns a accounts registration data structure. And then internally, kind of my last step is I convert that to my core data structure and I persist it in whatever means possible. Uh, so this is what this looks like. And again, we don't generate this by default, but this is what I want people to start thinking about, is you know, using Ecto's multi-features, I can take in a registration change set, which is just an embedded schema, so not connected to the database. And I can apply the changes to it to see if it's valid. So that I'm just casting user input into a raw data structure. If that data structure happens to be valid, the last step I'm gonna do is take that data, convert it into a user, and then insert that user into the database. So a little bit more code than you have to write, but in this way, I'm not polluting my w account user uh, with whatever feature I need on some form somewhere. Right, and keeping it um, isolated to parts of the application that require it. So this is just the kind of things I want people to start thinking about when they're designing um, any kind of application that, that touches the database, especially with Ecto. So part of this isolation message is getting people to focus on, okay, it's like we're isolating our modules, we're isolating uh, the boundaries of our APIs, so maybe we should isolate our applications. Uh, so Phoenix will ship with a a dash dash umbrella flag to generate an umbrella project, like mix new umbrella, and it's just not, I don't think every project needs to be an umbrella, but I do think umbrella projects are kind of underserved in the community. So we're gonna kind of walk through the merits of them, uh, why you wouldn't wouldn't use them. Uh, but if you pass the umbrella flag in, in Phoenix, you can notice we're, we wanna continue to send the same message. So instead of lib and then a web directory, if you pass dash dash umbrella to mix Phoenix new, we're gonna generate an app that's your application domain, that's where your app lives, right? And then we're gonna generate a web app with like whatever, if you type in my app, we're gonna make it my app web. And that's the web interface. And then le these are literally isolated. Like the only way they can talk to each other is across the boundary of the applications. 
So your app would not actually depend on the, the, the web application, but the web application in its own mixed dependencies in the umbrella would say, okay, I'm gonna depend on this app. So we can continue to send this message of, literally you have a web interface here to some greater um, application domain. So the whole point of Phoenix 1.3 is to get you to think about boundaries. So it's not the, that we can design your whole application, but we are gonna make you think just a little bit upfront about your design. So instead of like, you know, when you're scaffolding an application, you wanna generate something, some CRUD base, it's easy just to say, run a few commands and persist the data and it mostly works how you want it, but then a year down the road, two years down the road, now you've tried to grow that code and it's, it's an abomination. So we wanna think, we're gonna make you think a little bit upfront, a little bit of effort to think, okay, like where do things live? How should this be named? And we think that this hopefully is gonna pay dividends for you and the rest of the community in the future. So I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a thought experiment um, based on adding a feature to an application. And we can kind of see where, where we're going uh, with these ideas. Uh, so let's say that we wanna add some reaction feature for liking posts, right? If I wanna like a post, if I wanna dislike a post, or you know, Facebook has like the rage face, whatever. Um, prior to Phoenix 1.2, the kind of mode of operation would be, it's like, well, I have a web models directory, and I know I wanna put this in Postgres, so I'm just gonna add a reaction EX file, and now I have three, you know, three uh, models here, right? Uh, but the problem is, we're not, you're not thinking about the boundaries here. You're not thinking how this relates to the application. Um, and there's no, we're not giving you indication that you should be thinking any other way, right? You have to, you'd have to have some intuition on the design here. So we know that you know, this isn't necessarily where we wanna push people. And it's worse because in your controller, well, the way we were pushing you is, you'd say, okay, I have this code here, um, and this is where Phoenix wrote my code, so this must be where I write my code, uh, that you would start having to put ASOC here, right? I, I have to associate multiple things and have the controller be concerned with uh, not only how the data is inserted, but how do I actually associate it. So we know that this is not necessarily what we want. But now imagine you're using Phoenix 1.3 and you've used the generators, your directory structure looks like this. So now you come to this directory structure, and you're like, okay, I'm gonna add a reaction feature. By default, even if you're using the generators to generate the reaction feature, you have to think. It's like, hmm, where does this live? There's no dumping ground anymore, right? We, can't, we won't give you the easy out. So you have to, it's like, okay, well, where do, I, where do I save this file? So you can think by default, like, well, I wanna be able to like post and comments, so maybe I add it here, right? And maybe this is the right answer, but you have to think a little bit up front. Um, so at least you're putting it here, so let's, let's run through this. Let's say, okay, this is part of the blog system. I, can, I only have posts and comments that I can like. It should live here. And then I can compose something really nicely like this, because Phoenix is gonna generate a uh, function for me to kind of give me this hint. I can say, okay, get the post, and then pass the post into the blog system, let's like it. Nice and pretty, the controller doesn't have to know anything about it. And then within the blog module, since we've, this is where we've written your code for you before, if you're not even really thinking about greater design, right, you're a newcomer, you just wanna get started, you at least see like, oh, Phoenix generated this blog module. This is where it's doing the persistence and um, this is, must be where I write my code. So even if this is like the minimal jump that you can make, you'd be like, oh, this is where I write my code. There's a module here in functions. Then, then we've won. Uh, so at minimum, we want people to get here, where they're like, okay, I'm gonna add a function like post, and this is where I'm gonna do the associations, and I'm gonna do the, the database persistence, or whatever um, I need to do. Maybe this stores it in an agent or ads. But if we get people here, we actually have a, a well-defined API that has reusable code that you can grow in the future, right? If, like, if liking a post is now something we want to cache into ads, we can do it, right? We don't have to change our web interface or any, other, any of the other call sites. But my hope is we get people to think a little bit up front. So I'm not saying the previous way was bad, but if you're thinking about boundaries, you're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna add this new feature. You open up lib and you're like, hmm, I've got a blog system. I've got posts and comments. And you're like, you know what? A, a reaction system itself, th there's a boundary there, right? What if I, I'm gonna later add new resources into my system? Um, you know, I could add user profiles that people could like videos, anything. It's like maybe I should have this as its own boundary with its own data structures and own well-defined API. So our hope is people think, okay, I can create a new module and functions to do this thing here. And then in my controller, I can actually have these things completely uh, isolated. 
the controller could just say, okay, if you want to like a post, then we can actually call it, we have a module for that, get the post, and then reaction, add like, right? And these things don't even have to know about each other necessarily. So this could be nice because we don't have to depend on, the blog and reaction modules don't have to depend on one another. Uh, but you may also say like, well, I don't want to have to call into this explicitly to get the like count every time. Maybe every time I fetch a post or a list of posts, maybe I want the likes. Well, then the blog module can depend on the reaction module and they can just call the function, right? But the whole goal is these things can only communicate across their well-defined boundaries. So the fact that they could both be using Ecto and persisting that data is transparent to the modules, right? There's only a well-defined boundary and if I want to add a like, the blog module can just talk to the reaction module through that boundary. And then I can put the likes into the posts and now I have a nice abstracted uh, reacting system, right? And I know Phoenix has pushed me towards making this boundary so I can think, okay, my API is gonna look something like this, add like, remove like, get the like counts, um, this is nice and succinct. So now the jump that we think people might make is okay, I went from adding this file into a dumping ground to thinking about maybe it can live in the blog system to thinking about, oh, maybe it's its own boundary as a module. But now you're like, well, if it manages its own storage, right, it has its own boundary that can like any kind of resource, what if I had an umbrella app and I could take the leap and say, you know what, if this thing is totally isolated, instead of being an isolated module, maybe it's an entire isolated application. So this is just kind of the way we want people to think. So I'm not saying go home and rip every feature out as a module or just make everything an application. So don't, don't read too much into this, but at least think a little bit about your intent, right? And we want people to start being able to make these leaps earlier on. And if, if this is an isolated um, system, so if this reaction system manages its own storage, it can be starting start to stop, deployed in isolation, and then it could be put on hex and shared, right? So if someone makes a reaction engine, right, they could put that on hex, and now anyone that wants to be able to have resources in their app, liked, hated, disliked, uh, I can just drop that as an, in as a dependency, maybe configure it with a couple lines of code, and now we've shared this feature across the entire community. So these are the kind of things I want people to start thinking about. So don't go home and start you know, ripping out all your, all your code, but just start thinking a little bit about the kind of intentions of your APIs and the boundaries of, of your, your modules. Uh, but naturally it comes up like, you know, should or shouldn't you use an umbrella? And I was thinking like really hard about this because um, like at Dockyard, I'd say probably 50% of our projects are umbrellas and uh, I think there's a push that everyone thinks like, oh, umbrellas, is, it's a new secret sauce, so everything should be an umbrella. And I don't think that's correct. So I started out like, okay, I'm gonna make this flow chart. It's gonna be like, it's gonna be really impressive, but it, it turns out like for me personally, like this is pretty much my thought process. So this didn't need to be a flow chart, but um, I was excited about making a flow chart and this is what I ended up with. Um, but it, it boiled down to this, because this is a hard problem, right? It's like you, we don't wanna over optimize too early on. Um, but it came down for me that, you know, if my context, so my, 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 my module manages its own storage, if the answer is it doesn't, I'm using some shared database in my application, some shared storage engine, then I keep it in the same app. Because for me, those things are necessarily coupled. Uh, so I see some people that like, they split their application, a, a bunch of different umbrella applications that all depend on the same uh, repo and some other application that's depending on Postgres. It's like those things are now have like implicit dependencies across each other that like if you deploy one app and you need to run a migration, like it's just, you, you lose sight operationally of what's going on. So for me, if, if, unless it manages its own storage, I don't even think about splitting it out. But if it can be isolated and it is using its own nets table, it is separate from my uh, Ecto Postgres database, then I at least consider an umbrella. So I don't say like immediately extract it, but at least it's worth considering. Like this thing is totally isolated. If it manages how its data is stored, whether it's in a process, whether it's in another database, anything, then it can be deployed in isolation, started and stopped in isolation, and it's worth considering uh, extracting it out. So I've kind of, you know, I've been hyping like extract, extract, isolate, isolate, because this is how I want people to think. But I also want to then put the brakes on a little bit. That like, if everyone goes home and gets too carried away that, you know, everything, everything Taking and like taking step by step to extract, like it feels like you're making your code better, but it can actually increase the complexity of your application. So anytime you decouple your data model, so like you know databases, 
get a, lot, get a bad rap, but anytime you try to decouple your data, say like, you know what, we don't need to put this in Postgres, let's just put it in uh, a process, right? Maybe it's ephemeral-ish data that doesn't necessarily need to stay around forever. Uh, but every time you decouple your data model, you then have to increase the complexity of your app because anytime you wanna join or aggregate, aggregate data, you're now have to stitch that together by hand. So it's something that you have to think about. It may be worth it, it may be not. So here's one example. So this blog application, so a trivial feature, right? I, if I could store this data in Ecto, and then if I wanna get the like counts for all my posts, I could say repo preload, aggregate that data in one line of code with Ecto, and I have all the like counts. But if I decided to write this reaction engine now that is isolated, manages its own storage, has a API boundary there, I have to write code like this, where I have to say, okay, well now, if I want the blog, every time I get a blog post, if I want that like count value, I need to call into reaction. I need to have, it needs to have an API that takes a list of post IDs and then returns a, a, all the likes for any of those IDs and then go through each of those and if there was a like for it, then put the likes into that data structure. Like it's, it's not terrible, right? This is a small amount of code, but every time you make one of these decisions to isolate components, it's now on you to aggregate and stitch the data together. So just think about isolation, design with intent, but then think carefully about the trade-offs, right? Because it's not always uh, the best idea. So, that's the end of my talk. Phoenix 1.3 is, like I said, making you think a little bit, but I think in the future, we go one year, <laughs> two years down the road, or I inherit applications as a consultancy, and I, I wanna hope that we open up a directory structure and see some, some kind of like intentional, intentional design. Instead of web models, 100 files, we wanna see the feature set of the app. And I think as a community, if we do that, we'll be able to generate uh, new features that are shareable, that are taking the best that the ecosystem has to offer, right? So, um, like I said, don't get too carried away. Put the caution on, but design with intent. So, that's all I have. All right, so I did dot, uh, .NET and DDD for probably 10 years, and. I was looking at this bounded context concept, and I'm curious like how far down that DDD uh, rabbit hole you went, and if you did go fairly deep, did you look at the aggregate and aggregate root concepts? Yeah, so I looked at quite a bit, but the, the problem is like uh, I was also interested in like uh, CQRS uh, design, and I, I, I've done a lot of looking. So this Phoenix 1.3 was actually, it was like I promised it was out by the end of the year in Orlando last year. And it's taken a lot longer because the code hasn't been hard, but trying to make, like trying, like this is, these are best practices. So it's like how much do we put on people that is the right design for a broad use case, right? Because it's like anytime you apply any kind of decision in your application, it's like it's gonna vary on your, it's gonna vary on your use case. Um, so for us, this is just getting people to think about isolated modules and functions with well-named meanings, right? And then if you wanna use aggregates, right? If you wanna apply that, then that's great but we don't wanna tell people, like the last thing I wanted was to have like, okay, Phoenix now uses, like I looked into CQRS because like personally it was exciting, but then I was like, okay, Phoenix 1.3 is shipped, now read this 400 page book. Um, so I think that I'm, I'm very interested in, in those ideas and how we can solve, like how we can better aggregate data. So if people do have those questions now, it's like, okay, I followed this idea, I have this isolated component, now how can I make this code better? Um, that's definitely a great idea, but for the default, someone two weeks into the ecosystem, it'd be too much. Yep. Hey Chris, um, I'm just interested to know if you um, were starting Phoenix again today, thinking about these concepts, how differently would it be structured? How would the lib be structured? Phoenix. So I think how we're, we're doing it now. <laughs> but so, yeah, it's tricky because like there's always there's a backstory there because initially uh, <coughs> web there was no web directory at the root level. Um, so this is where like, that was actually, Jose, Jose pushed me in that direction, which is kind of funny too, because people that complain about it um, in the past, they're like, oh, Phoenix is special because of this web directory. I'm like, Jose himself, he was the one. <laughs> I mean, I agree, but yeah, so I think a lot of this is a learning process for Jose and I, Jose and I as well, um, about these, um, pushing people in these, these right directions. And it's always a balance of like, you know, how much do you, do you push and how much, um, like, because every time we push, we potentially put up a barrier. 
Because at the end of the day, someone is coming into the ecosystem and they're like, I just want to, I just want to insert a post in the database. Like I don't, like you know what I mean? It's it's a balance. So I think we're at a happy balance here. Um, you know, obviously this is how I would design it. Um, you know, if I can go back, that's how I would design it. Um, but talk to me in, in three years and maybe the answer would be different. No, I'm going to talk to you next year, mate. <laughs> no, I was sort of saying, you're talking here about how you, how you design the user experience and partition that up. I'm talking yep. about how you design the framework itself, like the uh, code of the framework itself. Uh, so I don't think the code of the framework itself um, would change much. Um, it depends on that, because Phoenix, the, the the stateful bits, um, the interesting bits for me are, are in Phoenix PubSub now. Um, so Phoenix Core is mostly uh, a plug extraction and you know about about transforming a connection and building a feature set around that, uh, rendering you know taking that data and uh, rendering it in the Phoenix View layer. So I think like our our neat features in Phoenix Core are are mostly uh, transformational features. So like taking the data, precompiling the template. Um, Phoenix PubSub definitely was more of a learning process where my initial take at Phoenix PubSub was a disaster. It was horrible. That's where like Jose was like, wow, this, you know, basically nicely said this, th this could be a lot better. Um, but the high level API that I got was, was what I wanted. So like our channel layer worked exactly how I, how I wanted it, but I didn't know enough of um, OTP and how I should be structuring the underlying um, bits. So that would be totally different, um, but I don't think it'd be it's not something that I think I could have done any better at the time. It's something I had to kind of level up into. So as Phoenix evolves and we're making these changes on how you think about how to organize your structure, <coughs> we've seen to over the past three or four versions had several distinct changes. Do we have a web directory? Now we don't have a web directory. Now we're having these contexts. Are you worried at all about sort of this semi-whiplash uh, hurting adoption and getting people confused as they're either looking at documentation and a new version comes out and all of a sudden they have to switch their mental thinking or concerns like that? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a big concern because the, like, well, one, and then, like, the guides have to be re rewritten. So I had planned on releasing 1.3 with the guides done, and um, I'm going to release 1.3 this month. It, this month, it's happening. It's almost done. Uh, but then the guides are going to be my next effort, uh, and the Phoenix book has to be, you know, has to have a new edition out. Um, so it's just personally, it's a big undertaking. Uh, but then also, like that's why it's taken so long to feel out these ideas, um, like the data centric schemas I mentioned. That was I wrote the code generators to actually do that ecto multi embedded schemas um, by default, and then ended up backtracking because it was just too much. Like it wasn't a ton of code, and it's code that I would write personally but you have to balance that getting started experience. And as far as the changes in, in Whiplash, I think, um, this, I think this change will not be, this is not gonna be Whiplashy. And I'll, I'll give you a reason, because all, all we're doing is we're generating modules and functions, right? We're not, there's no, when you generate a context, there's no use Phoenix context. It's literally def whatever and a function definition. Um, since we use Ecto by default, it's gonna have your repo insert code. Uh, so I think there's no backlash because that's how I think that's how if you're in the ecosystem and you're an advanced programmer, you're going to say, okay, I have this web interface. If I'm not thinking about bounded context, I have some feature. I'm going to write a module. I'm going to write functions in it. Uh, so I don't see some giant course correction from here. Like, I don't think it's going to be like, oh, I should have, we have to go back and write all our code in the controllers now. So I don't think that there will be a big course correction, but it is something I have to weigh heavily with, with new ideas, right? Like if we did introduce, like I, I want to, I'm interested in service discovery, right? So if I want to introduce these discoverable services and processes, every time I do that, I have to think, like, this, this has got to be a stepping stone to kind of my future goals. So, Chris, I really want to commend you on how much you are thinking about bringing the new users along. Um, I think it's a big deal that, that you're up here saying that scaffolding isn't the way we're going to be writing applications. It's the way that we teach. Yep. Um, and we need a mature book. We need the documents all to be in line. Um, and that patience, I think, does a great justification uh, or does, does great things for the community. Great. Thank you. 
Uh, so your flowchart uh, where you're deciding whether to break into an umbrella application is pretty kind of similar to our flowchart for when we might split something into its own GitHub repo and put it up as a microservice. So I'm wondering, like, do you have any opinions on when you might choose one approach over the other? Like, what might go into that decision? Sure, yes. Yeah. So if it's, if it's an Elixir, so if we're strictly speaking as, like, all those microservices are Elixir applications, then, and they're all part of the same greater uh, platform that you're writing, I would just put it all on, on one umbrella app. And granted, it's like, depending on your team size and the commits and, and conflicts with merging, but for me, umbrellas give us the microservice architecture. Like we can define, so here's one example that I, I didn't mention. Like at Dockyard, we, we made it, like by default, I chose an umbrella for this application. And it was a pretty simple application, but it had, its main purpose was to connect to uh, Amazon SQS queue that was powered by other parts of their domain or other applications not in Elixir and it was going to serve some channel interface on the, on the browser. Uh, so ahead of time I said, okay, we've got this staple thing that's going to be listening on a queue and this thing can be, that thing can be deployed in isolation. So if you think about microservices like I can have 10 web front ends because I want to load balance the web front end but I'm, I want to consume this queue. I don't want to have every web front end I deploy shouldn't be running a queue consumer. I only need one of these things, processing messages and deciding how to you know, broadcast them. Uh, so for me, it's gonna depend on um, your deployments. So the micro, the, the, all the benefits of microservices through deployments, starting and stopping in isolation, you get from, a, from an umbrella app. So the only reason I would even think about splitting as a separate Git repo is if I had like a huge team who couldn't manage a big code base. But I think, isn't like Facebook's, I think Facebook's whole code base is like one repo. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I think there's no benefit in splitting. I think there's a huge benefit in keeping everything underneath one um, if it's all in Elixir because then if you can deploy these applications together and you can cluster them, what used to be, uh, you know, RabbitMQ or uh, HTTP JSON API call is now just a gen server call internally. So, right, if I have some name process from one of my apps, I can just say gen server call whatever and now I'm talking to this app across the cluster. So it's, it's a huge win for me to keep them together. I think the million dollar question is, do you have a pulse on an ETA and then also uh, when you do have an existing model folder that has tons of models and, or, and just a dumping ground, is it possible right now to basically take those and start organizing or not possible? Is it recommended approach to start organizing those in a more bounded context to move those later to when 1.3 is done? Yeah, I mean, you can move them now. So like. 1.3, as far as like, we've got some minor features. So action fallback is probably the, the bigger feature. Um, there's just, you know, a handful of APIs like being able to get your current URL in the, in the controller. So mostly it's about core, code organization. And the majority of the new code from, from the commits is just into the generators. So if you're not using generators, you can just put your code into the new format. Uh, so I would recommend that. Um, it, it, I think it'd be interesting, I think, for me to talk to people who have gone down that path. So I think you're probably going to find, like me, like when we were writing the Phoenix book, that we ran into these cases where um, we were like, wow, if we, you know, if we would have thought about isolation just a little bit up front, we wouldn't have had to um, end up refactoring our code later. So I think as you start trying to isolate these pieces, there's going to be spots in the code that you're like, wow, there's really no reason I should have coupled there. But since you didn't have to think about it, um, not even as a beginner, it's like just as an as expert programmer, like if you're not having to think a little bit, you know, that could it's gonna change your design. So I think, yeah, start splitting now and let me know how it goes. Oh, ETA, so I said this month. Um, there's, so the generators are all uh, in place now. So I, like on the flight here, I polished the documentation. At this point, I just need to add a few checks. Like if you try to run the generators in an umbrella now, like if you try to run mixed finish gen blog comment from an umbrella root, it generates the files like inside lib in the umbrella root. So there's just a few like validation checks and then I need to walk through uh, Josie and I need to kind of go through with a fine tooth comb and just make sure like the conventions that we want and the, and the generated code are like fully baked. So this month, it's gonna happen. Uh, in response to the last question, my talk at 3.30 is exactly about you had a monolith, you broke it up, and now we broke it up into an umbrella. Yeah, uh, shattering into an umbrella. Yeah, so, so take Luke's, and Luke, are, are, are you, you got to redo a bunch of slides or are you good? <laughs> But, but no major scramble to, okay, yeah. Because like I said, at the end of the day, these ideas aren't like 
let's go down this uncanny valley of like new design patterns, new ideas. Like the big idea is like, oh, we can have modules and functions um, that have well-defined uh, clear APIs. And I think like no matter what, everyone can agree that that's a good thing. And that's kind of the starting point that we're pushing people towards. And then how you grow from there is going to depend on on your, you know, your application. Hey, uh I really like what you uh, just talked about. I think it makes sense. I think you should always try, try to do the right thing. You know, even though it's gonna have some collateral damage at some yep. point, I think you know, it can be avoided. But you know, if you keep doing the right thing, I think you're on a good purpose. Uh, one thing that I, I see you know, in applications is a lot of time in the model level, there's a lot of business logic. You know? How is the data going to be inserted? How is the data going to be queried? And that's where the kitchen sinks, you know, syndrome yep. comes in too, right? What are your thoughts about, you know, how about just treating storage just for what it is? You know, I've got insert, you know, product type stuff, validation, but where do you put the business logic? You know, does that go in a separate umbrella? You know, does, you know, does those rules about how people are actually going to use the app live in their own context somewhere? Or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so for me, they're necessarily coupled together. Um, not always, but I think, like, if I call into, let's see if I have, if I go back here. Like, the whole goal with, like, blog list comments, right? By default, I don't know if I generate that or not. But by default, all list comments is going to do is call repo all comment, right? But the caller doesn't, have, doesn't know that we're forming an ecto repo and we're hitting a Postgres database, right? So to me, that's not necessarily the, the details of that boundary. And you can split, like, it's not that we need some, like, God module there in blog. Like, that blog module can split out its logic. Uh, but for me personally, um, storage, the storage of my app usually lives alongside, um, the, the business logic lives alongside how that storage is handled. But the callers don't know necessarily the details of that, right? Yeah, and I'll, I'll add one more thing though. So one more thing. So part of this is like if, if we talk about like pure functions. So I, like if, if I'm writing some authorization layer in my app, um, where's is Nico in here from Dockyard? Yeah, Nico's in the back. I think Nico wrote a blog post for Dockyard, like how do to write some authorization layer? Like can a user like a policy type system? Like do I have act, uh, authorization to take certain actions on certain resources? Um, you know, that isn't, for me, so that's, that's quite a bit of business logic there. Um, but it's all pure functions. So for me, that would be one case where I'd, we're going to define a module with function definitions, and they just operate, they operate on data structures. They don't have to fetch any data. They get a user, they get a post, and they get the users, you know, they, they, can, they have the data that they need to make the decision. So I think in general, it's best to structure your code as pure functions where possible, but I wouldn't then split that out in a separate app, or I don't see the value of splitting that out in a separate app. I mean, I think it kind of goes a long way in terms of tra still trying to figure out what is the intent of the application. You know, I, I, when I define an application, I actually tend to have a store umbrella type project and also business logic, which is kind of a common ground where people can go and look at what, what is this application actually doing. So maybe another you know, point of reference, I would think, in the application. Yep. But another comment, I, you know, I wasn't, the, I'm not sure what it's called now, but uh, when you had the uh, action something. Action callback, or action fallback, rather. Yeah. So there I feel a little bit uncomfortable. Maybe, you know, it's my Go background. So in Go, you know, when you make a call, you know, you have the OK comma uh, you know, signature, right? Here, I think, you know, there's a little bit of magic. You know, I think if, if there is, you, I agree there's repetition about, every time having to check for the return signature. But I think it clarifies what the intent, you know, this thing can fail. You know, and I think being kind of maybe less magic, but yeah, maybe a little bit of redundancy, you know, in terms of checking, uh, still clarifies what the intent of the call is. My, just my opinion. Yeah, so in, in this case, so we thought, like I think if you watch my Orlando talk, I called this a responder, um, which is kind of a troll on the Rails community, um, but it's, it's a similar, so we didn't want to introduce this like new concept, right? Like the whole, the goal was that we had these data structures that we handled in the same way every time. And it's like, what do we call this thing? Like, you know, its whole job is to send a response. Like, so, so Jose and I spent like, this is where, like, this is why stuff just takes so long. It's like, you know, I had a thesaurus.com up, like, what do I call this thing? It's like, 
we were like, oh, we just call it like a handler. It's like, you know, handler is like, if there's like, anytime you name something a handler, it's like a cop out. Like there's a, there's a cowboy handler in the, and there's like a few handlers in the Phoenix code base. But like, it's like, we can't call it a handler. Like, um, so anyway, so, the th so like, it, this may look like magic, but the goal is like, you have this plug pipeline. And the plug contract is you take a connection in, you return a connection. And anytime you don't do that, it's gonna fail, right? It's gonna raise an exception, rightly so. So we said, okay, like the whole point of this thing is really just to take a value and turn it into a connection. Um, that's all it does. And action fallback, while that is a macro, all it is is a plug. So it's like, we were, it was actually beautiful that Jose and I were like, you know, let's introduce this responder idea, and then that can, you could say, use Phoenix responder. Um, that can define some functions, and we pass them in, and then uh, Jose was like, you know what, this is almost like just like a two-con function, like, you know, takes a value and converts it to a connection. And we were like, oh, wait, we have a contract for that. Like, that's the plug contract. It's a def call and uh, takes a connection and a value as the second argument. So we're like, well, we have the connection as the value passed in before the action, and we need that data if we don't get the connection back. Uh, so we actually had this beautiful contract already in there, which is plug. So there's, the only magic here is that we wrap your controller functions and say, if you return something that's not a connection, then we just call this plug. And that's it. So it's very, very little magic. All right, let's give it